introducing myself and welcoming everyone. I am Denise Stika, and I am the Executive Director of Center County Library and Historical Museum. And I am one of the um, happy members of the Center County Read Steering Committee. And when we decided to select the address book as our 2021 selection, I was pretty excited about that because I'd actually picked it up and read um, part of it before we even began the program. Um, and so I was just really intrigued with the whole concept of addresses. And um, we decided on the steering committee that this book had a lot of different avenues to explore that related directly to our lives in Center County. And one of the things that really intrigued me about the address book and thinking about our current um, political um, arena and what was going on was the connection between where you live and how that impacts who you get to vote for. And I just, that was sort of in the back of my mind while I was reading this book because it was during the run into the elections. And so I turned to an organization called Fair Districts PA to see if they had anyone who might be willing to be a part of our center County Reads program this year to kind of talk a little bit about this because it was really something that just um, was grasping my interest. So I am very pleased to present to you this morning our, our speaker, Debbie Trudeau, who is a member of Fair Districts PA, and she's going to be explaining a little bit more about what that is, but she is in addition to being a member of this organization, she's also a classic violinist and had a wonderful career as a music teacher. And she's very passionate about music and she seems to be very passionate about all sorts of things, one of which is fair districting in Pennsylvania. So um, before we really get into the heart of what Debbie's gonna talk about, one of the things we would like to know is where everyone is from. So if we could just do a sort of around the grid, and I'm going to call on people based on the names that I can see on my screen, and ask you to just say your name and what municipality or township or borough you live in. And I'll start, I, as I said, I'm Denise, and I live in Half Moon Township. And I'm going to go to Sean next. Hi, uh, Debbie and all. Uh, Debbie, thank you so much for being here for the discussion today. I'm really looking forward to it. And thank you, Denise, for organizing this. Uh, I live right here in State College, and uh, uh, I direct the Center for American Letter Studies here, which is a proud partner with the program. And uh, yeah, I'm, I, these are really, really exciting topics and points of focus. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you again, Debbie, for all right, and let's go to, I believe it's Anne. Anne, you'll need to unmute yourself. Um, can you, I did unmute. Um, I'm Anne Sager, I live in Belfont. I really appreciated the reading of the address book and I'm looking forward to today. Thank you. How about, let's go to Maria. Hey everybody, I'm Maria Birchall. I'm head of adult services for Sklo Library and I live in Harris Township. Okay, thank you. And Elizabeth. Uh, I am in Spring Township and loving it. Uh, I came not too long ago from Dayton, Ohio. All right, thank you, Elizabeth, welcome. Um, I see a name that says C. Fulis. Hello, Good my morning. name is Connie and I live in Warminster, Pennsylvania and I am here at um, the gracious invitation of the Trudeaus. Thanks, welcome. Uh, let's go to Eunice. Hi all, um, I'm, I'm in State College um, but my, I guess, permanent local address is uh, Singapore. I'm an international student at Penn State, a uh, PhD student. Um, I, I just woke up, so not the most presentable. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Good morning, Eunice. And um, Amber. Hi, my name is Amber Miller, and I live in Ferguson Township. And I just found out about this yesterday, so I haven't read the book, but it's a topic I'm interested in. So I'm very glad to be here, and nice to see you all today. Thank you. Well, good morning to everyone. Just a, a, 
And then a reminder to mute yourself during the presentation. We are going to be recording this and we will be having the link posted to um, the Center County Library uh, YouTube channel, but we will also be sharing the link out. As Debbie goes through her presentation and you have any questions or comments, please do put them into the chat. I will be monitoring the chat um, as we go forward. And um, we're gonna go through for about a half an hour or so, and then there will be some time for questions after that. So I am going to now turn this over to Debbie. Thank you. Hi, I see that we have added oh, Carlene Krevkor. Yes. Um, and where are you from, Carlene? Uh, right in State College, Bozeburg, Pennsylvania. Okay. So Excellent. Okay, um, just so you all know, I'm going to be recording this part of the presentation. Um, let's see. Yes. Record to the cloud. Okay. And I'm going to share my screen. So you should all be able to see my title page and, and the behind the curtain, the backstage. And now I'm going to hit play and you should see full screen, an antidote to partisan poison title page. I hope yes, um, anybody that can't <laughs> complain about it in chat and uh, Denise will let me know. So, um, I wanna thank you for having me here. It's my pleasure to be doing this. Um, I've been volunteering with Fair District of Pennsylvania here in Center County um, and have been a local coordinator and I'm sharing that role now so I have more time to do speaking events like this. Uh, Fair Districts of Pennsylvania was formed in 2016 as a subset of the League of Women Voters, which has been challenging gerrymandering since 1991. So 30 years this has been going on. We think the first step to more responsive government is to end gerrymandering. No matter what other reforms you want to see, until this changes, nothing else changes. Our nonpartisan volunteers have been working to change the process of drawing our legislative and congressional districts from one of partisan gain to a process that is more transparent, inclusive, measurable, and fair. I'm a violinist and a teacher, so I like to refine explanations. I was explaining gerrymandering to my eight-year-old violin student and I said, imagine that you and I are playing a game. What if the rules make it so that I win every single time? What would you do? And he said, I would quit playing. So I asked him, what else could you do? And he thought about it and he said, I would change the rules. So there it is in a nutshell, we are not quitting. Let's explore the cause and the antidote to the partisan poison that is boiled over so that we can nurture our democracy back to health with a fairer process that is not red, not blue, just fair. So we're going to cover how the state government operates, gerrymandering, rules for moving legislation, comparing a good bill with a bad bill and escaping the vicious cycle. So for those of you uh, that moved here from out of state or forgot, we're gonna start with a quick refresher about how Pencil Pennsylvania government is supposed to work. There are three branches of government. Whoa, that was fast. Hang on, let's back up. We have the three branches of government and the way that Pennsylvania handles reapportionment and redistricting. So first from basic vocabulary, the state assembly is made up of both the Pennsylvania House and Senate. Your legislators are representatives in the House and senators in the Senate. The legislators write laws, which are first discussed in committees. The committees can hold hearings and consider amendments, then vote whether to pass it out to the full chamber where there can be further discussion, further amendments. Then a bill has three floor votes before final passage. If it passes, the bill goes to the other chamber where the process is repeated. A bill passed in both chambers then goes to the governor for a signature or veto. We think of the two chambers as independent of each other and with the idea that uh, folks are sharing and, and communicating and compromising across the aisle. In fact, in Pennsylvania, there is no aisle. It's more like a barricade between the two parties. 
Each caucus sets its own policy and priorities. They write the newsletters for members, they call party meetings, they spread talking points, but they operate without any public record. Each caucus has its own separate budget. These are the two largest line items in the state budget. The governor signs or vetoes bills created by the legislature. For example, congressional district maps are passed as a bill which the governor signs or vetoes. There are two situations where the legislature can bypass the governor. Constitutional amendments, which must pass the assembly in two consecutive sessions in identical form, then go on to a voter referendum for final passage. You may have seen three amendments in your local papers this week in preparation for a public vote in the May primary. The second situation is for redistricting the Pennsylvania House and Senate. The Pennsylvania courts start with the minor courts. These are the magisterial district courts, the Philadelphia Municipal Court, and the Pittsburgh Municipal Court. This is where you would challenge a traffic ticket. Next are the courts of common pleas. These are trial courts and also sometimes hear appeals in cases from the minor courts. Some cases before courts of common pleas are heard by juries and some are heard just by judges. These districts are mostly county level with 60 regions covering our 67 counties. And last are the high courts, also called the appellate courts or courts of appeal. These are the superior commonwealth and supreme courts. All 31 of these judges are elected statewide and serve 10 year terms with retention elections. The Supreme Court has the final say on matters of the Pennsylvania Constitution. All three appellate courts would be affected by the House Bill 38, uh, a proposed constitutional amendment seeking to create judicial districts. It's proposing three sets of districts, one for each of the different appellate courts. Um, and as with other uh, redistricting, they would change every 10 years. Uh, this would be a legislative bill that the governor would sign just like congressional districts. So after the census to account for population changes and shifts, all states redraw boundaries for US congressional districts and their state legislative districts. Reapportionment means dividing the 435 congressional seats among the states by population. Pennsylvania is likely to lose a seat in Congress from 18 to 17. Redistricting refers to redrawing the boundaries of those districts. Each state determines its own redistricting process. In Pennsylvania, we have two different processes for making those districts. For the congressional map, the assembly passes a legislative bill, which the governor signs. The state house and Senate maps are created by a legislative redistricting commission or LRC. The LRC includes the majority and minority party leaders from both the house and the Senate. And these four people are supposed to agree on a fifth person to serve as chair. That fifth person cannot be a paid local state or federal government employee. The first four rarely agree, so that person is instead appointed by the majority party of the state Supreme Court, which is currently Democratic. The majority party of the state Supreme Court usually determines the three to two majority party on the LRC. It's important to fully understand the two processes. The LRC just creates the Pennsylvania Assembly districts. There is no bill, there are no public hearings, no one votes and the governor does not sign off. He can't veto a bad map. The courts are the only remedy. Public challenges have a very limited 30-day 30 day window. The state constitution requires that House and Senate districts must be compact, contiguous, and must avoid splitting a county, city, town, borough, township, or ward unless absolutely necessary. Clearly that is being ignored. Interestingly, those same criteria are not specified for congressional districts. The full assembly introduces a legislative bill for the congressional map. It has to pass in the House and Senate, then is signed by the governor. Appeals must include plaintiffs from every state congressional district. So to appeal the assembly maps, you have a 30 day limit. To appeal congressional maps, those can be appealed, be appealed any time. So, uh, in both cases with these maps, the drawers will decide whom to reward, whom to punish, and where to carve out winnable districts that favor their party for the next 10 years to the extent they can get away with it. 
There is a 2019 Slate Magazine article about a seminar run by the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, on how to gerrymander without getting caught. In 2011, the Republicans controlled all three branches and thus all three maps. The congressional map bill was passed twice as an empty shell that only said congressional maps will be created. The day before its third and final vote, individual legislators were shown their own particular districts. No one saw the entire map before they voted. Members were told by their caucus to vote in favor. This year, it will be more complicated. The Democrats have a three to two, or excuse me, five to two majority on the Supreme Court, so they will likely control that LRC. But the Republicans currently control the assembly, so they will control the bill to make the congressional map. But that map will have to pass approval by the Democratic governor. Both parties are aware of increased public and legal scrutiny this year. Gerrymandering has been around since 1812 when Massachusetts Governor Elbridge Geary signed off on a map with a district shaped like a salamander. The Boston newspaper dubbed it the Gerrymander, now pronounced gerrymander. Gaming the rules is not a new concept. Both parties do it. Some call it the spoils of war. Gerrymandering of Pennsylvania's districts has been a problem for a long time, but the use of computers makes it much worse. You've seen our poster child, Donald kicking Goofy or Bullwinkle, in the congressional, uh, the old congressional seventh district in the lower right corner. Instead of a piece of paper on a wall and a best guess about where the votes are, a computer application nowadays can generate a functional map in as little as two hours. That's how long it took one of the recent winners of the last Draw the Lines competition. Draw the Lines is an organization that hosts district drawing competitions every six months. Uh, they have winning categories for high school level, college, and uh, general public. Uh, we have here in Center County, a statewide winner at the high school level. Uh, uh, Kyle Hines won twice in a row and they asked him to please step down and give someone else a turn next time. <laughs> but we're very proud of him. Um, Draw the Line's goals are to generate interest among voters and to create a pool of experienced and knowledgeable map drawers. Other mapping apps include Dave's redistricting app, Representable, District R, Maptitude, and these are free and you can go on your computer and download them and try your hand at it. It's kind of an interesting dive. So here's how you gerrymander. On the left, you see what would look like competitive dress districts with a healthy mix of all parties and independents. On the right, you see a sweetheart deal where you win some and I win some. Cracking then splits the opposition into minority slivers, which are divided between multiple districts. Packing bundles the opposition into just a few districts and forces wasted votes. Then there's also hijacking when you draw a candidate's residence off the map or draw a map to keep a strong potential challenger out of a district. So the 2017 court case challenging our congressional maps used five different metrics to measure for gerrymandering. Here are two that I can explain to you. There's the efficiency gap or wasted votes. If a district is 80 to 20 by registration, then the majority only needs 21% to win and has wasted 59%. This is a very high gap and could be a flag for gerrymandering. If a district is 51 to 49, then they've only wasted 2% for a very low gap, demonstrating a more competitive district. If one party has lots of high ratios and the other party has lots of low ratios, that's a flag for gerrymandering overall. Another measure is the ratio of the perimeter to the area of a district. A circle is the most efficient. Deviation from that number can also be a tip off for gerrymandering. So to gerrymander a map, you start with precinct level data from prior elections. This is a map of the 2008 presidential election results that House Speaker at the time, Mike Terzai used in 2011 to gerrymander Pennsylvania. The pale shades indicate a closer election compared to dark shades, which were more definitive. What it doesn't show is population density. A large dark red spot in rural area like Cameron County with only 3,000 voters isn't proportional to a tiny dark blue spot in densely populated Philadelphia County with 1,058,000 voters. The black lines you see here are the Senate uh, districts that were created using that data in 2012. Notice all the peculiar shapes in the urban areas. Harrisburg, Philly, and Pittsburgh are carefully cracked and packed. In the lower right, 
Notice this broad red area reaching northwest of Trenton. Above that, notice how the district scoops away a strong blue area on the east, then skirts blue Scranton and Wilkesbury at the far west edge and then tucks up just underneath it. Notice all these pale shades in central Pennsylvania. There's a lot of blue and pink in that region. Dark red Blair County is carefully isolated from paler Cambria to the west. And notice how much blue there is in that region, that whole southwest corner of south of Pittsburgh. So these are the 2020 Senate election results that came out of that gerrymandering. 28 Republican districts to 21 Democratic districts. The blue disappeared from the rural areas and most of the red disappeared from the largest cities. The yellow district is currently vacant. The gentleman passed away. And the green is the lone independent uh, Republican who, excuse me, independent Senator who caucuses with the Republicans. So even though the data used to draw the districts in 2011 showed many shades in our purple state, this map gives a very different impression that all of central Pennsylvania is one party and the big cities are all the other party. Despite a party registration ratio of roughly three Republicans to four Democrats to one independent, the party who drew these maps swept the seats by roughly four to three in the assembly and nearly three to one in Congress. So these are some maps now that show the center county region. We have Stephanie Borowitz to the north of us. Scott Conklin is the only House representative all uh, inside of Center County. Um, Senator or Representative Irvin's district runs nearly 80 miles to the south and uh, Representative Benninghoff's district straddles Center and Mifflin County. So now I've overlaid the school districts to show you how these communities of interest are divided among the different representatives. There's not a single school district that falls completely in a single representative's district. And that makes it hard. Uh, if you're the school superintendent and you need some help from your representative, you can't just call one person. Uh, and I know in here in State College, it's very frustrating because they've got three different people and those three different people have their attention drawn to a lot of other places. So this is uh, drilling down into the state college area. You can see how an interesting uh, meander there. And we're gonna go a little closer still. Uh, that precinct 49 has been split. And then we get down here. Uh, these are uh, Irvin's district in blue and Benninghoff's district in the la lavender. And there's a cul-de-sac where people are in two different districts in a very small neighborhood. And that's the sort of thing we would really like to avoid. And here it is again, this is a, a congressional district. Uh, when the districts are redrawn in 2018, the special master who is from Stanford University in California was told to respect township lines, I imagine, so he did. But the township line between Patton and Ferguson is a straight line that was drawn 100 years ago. And now the whole park forest neighborhood overlays that and it has all kinds of squiggly meandering streets and cul-de-sacs. And so people are split, it makes no sense. So this one is an even closer detail of downtown State College area. Some of you might notice that interesting spur out to the far right of the orange district. Um, I thought that was uh, a weird you know, flag for gerrymandering, but I looked closely and it turns out that is the Center Hills Golf Course. Um, and that's one of the stretches of that. So they kept that together. And let's see, another area that looks like it's not terribly gerrymandered. Um, I can't find it right now. Sometimes shapes that look like straight lines are, are not as clean as you would think compared to meanders that you would think are a flag and they aren't either. Then we also have the situation with prison gerrymandering. We have three prisons in Center County, Rockview, Benner, and the Center County Correctional Facility. And all three of them fall in Stephanie Borowitz's district, House 76, 
there are 4,445 uh, 4, people in those prisons who cannot vote there. They, um, if they have not lost their voting privileges, they have to vote in their hometowns. So if they are, uh, as residents of the prison, upset with what's going on in the prison, uh, they have to reach out to their representative back in Philly. Philly calls the prison and the prison says, I'm sorry, you want my representative. Or the representative says, I'm sorry, those people aren't in my, you know, that facility is not in my district, I can't help you. So it skews how many votes she would have needed to, uh, to win. Um, I looked at the election results and that would have almost been enough to tip the balance to another candidate in her last election. So it makes a difference. Um, then I wanted to show you this interesting Senate district in Blair County. You can see that little itty bitty neck. Um, and here's the detail of that. Uh, there are two roads that come in from opposite sides that don't connect. So if you wanted to walk through the district without leaving the district, you would have to do some serious bushwhacking up over the mountain. So gerrymandering, we say, is the root of the vicious cycle. Rig districts protect incumbents from their voters and instead make them beholden to party leaders and donors. There are no limits on campaign money in Pennsylvania. Incumbents with seniority become the committee and floor leaders and they make the rules. Each new legislative session opens with a vote to accept the rules without amendments. New members have no input and have just ceded all control for two years to their party leaders. This session, all House committees have a 15 to 10 majority party ratio. The rules allow senior leaders to push their pet priorities while they quash minority party proposals. In 2017, Representative Metcalf, the Republican chair of the state government committee announced publicly that he would not consider any bill proposed by the Democrats in his committee. In the last session, the majority passed the majority party passed 271 bills compared to the minority party's 19 out of 5,960 bills proposed. That's 4.8%. Party leaders control redistricting and use gerrymandering to punish and reward the rank and file members. The problem with gerrymandering is it leads to unresponsive legislators and discourages both candidates and voters. Why bother to vote when the outcome is a foregone conclusion? Why bother to run if the results are predetermined? In the 2020 election, 68 of 203 House seats were unopposed. That's one third of the total. So how bad are Pennsylvania? Oh, nope, skip back. Here we go, this one. Um, how bad are Pennsylvania's rules? Fair Vote and the Bipartisan Policy Center studied policies for an effective, efficient, responsive legislature and created a list of best practices. This map shows the states rated on an index of the fairness of rules governing the legislative agenda in their state chambers. In states with high scores, rules like automatic calendaring of bills and requirements that committees hear or report all bills mean that majority party leaders are less able to block legislation and overrule a bipartisan majority. In states with low scores, majority party leaders have the power to ensure that only their priorities advance through committees and onto the floor. States received one point for the presence of each of these rules in a chamber with the index equal to the percent of possible points earned. Colorado earned 100% for their fairness for governing the legislative agenda in their state chambers. Pennsylvania earns 0%. That means we have no policies in place in the Pennsylvania legislature to ensure that bills with strong bipartisan support will get a vote. A few partisan gatekeepers can block bills with strong bipartisan and public support like redistricting reform or push through partisan bills with no public support like the judicial district bill. Other states do things differently. Colorado got redistricting reform through their state legislature and approved by voters in just three months. Why are we still having so much trouble five years in here? In 2018, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decided that gerrymandering was unacceptable and mandated that congressional districts be redrawn. However, they couldn't change the process for drawing the districts in the first place. We don't have citizen initiative here in Pennsylvania, so the assembly has to make that change for us. 
For almost five years, we worked hard to persuade our legislators to pass a constitutional amendment to create an independent citizens commission to draw all three maps. One of those bills had 110 co-sponsors, more than any other bill in that session or the sessions before or after. It's very hard work to get that many co-sponsors. It involves training volunteers, setting up legislative meetings, keeping track of what the legislators say, and going back to ask again. When the legislators failed to pass these reform bills, we considered their objections and came back with another bill. That bill keeps political leaders involved as they insisted, but requires greater transparency, public meetings, statewide hearings, using measurable data and other strict criteria. We did everything we could think of to demonstrate support from the voters to our legislators. We gathered hundreds of support resolutions, newspaper op-eds and letters to the editor, petition signatures and more. But none of this matters. The bills never received a final vote. A good bill with popular support was stalled. Now let's look at a bad bill. With bad rules, bad bills sail through. We've been asking for years now to end gerrymandering, but instead the majority party leadership wants to ram through judicial districts that would create an opportunity for even more gerrymandering. It doesn't provide something the public has asked for. It proposes instead something the public does not want. On its first trip to the assembly last session, it passed out of committee on a strict party line vote with almost no discussion, no expert testimony and no public input. There is no transcript. Discussion was less than an hour. It passed with no minority party votes. It was briefly discussed in the Senate State Government Committee on July 13th as one bill among many. Only one question was asked, but was not given a clear answer. Some objections were raised and no response was given. The entire time of consideration was less than nine minutes. Two days later, it passed the full Senate. As a constitutional amendment, it must pass again in a consecutive session with no amendments. In January 2021, it barely passed the House Judiciary Committee by 13 to 12 with two Republican lawyers opposed. There was no due diligence, no hearings, no minority support and bipartisan opposition. House Bill 38 is a bad bill. It's a constitutional amendment to create three sets of appellate court districts. Instead of voting for all 31 judges, voters will only choose three from their small slice of the state. Why is it bad? Judges are not representatives beholden to constituents. That's the job of your representative or senator. Judges should consider only law and the constitution. Judicial districts tip the balance of power to the legislature and governor, undermining the checks and balances of the three co-equal branches. It prioritizes location of residents over qualifications and experience. People move all their lives, but state laws don't vary by region. Gerrymandering of judicial districts means that judges and parties could be punished or favored by partisan map drawers in the legislature. Outside money in judicial elections means it would cost, it would less to flip a judicial election in a small slice of the state. This bill failed it by 18 to 29 votes the first time in 1989, and it's failed 10 more times since then. It was actually the poison pill that killed our redistricting reform a couple years back. So some supporters are justifying this bill by saying that it would provide for greater diversity on our appellate courts, which sounds like a good thing. Here's the diversity we already have. We have party diversity that looks like a pretty good split. Gender diversity looks pretty good. Three women and four men on the Supreme Court in particular. Regional diversity looks pretty good. We have judges coming from 22 counties. Although where folks are from is a very fuzzy term. Are you from where you're born or where you were raised or where you were schooled or where you're working? And why should that even matter? Racial diversity is definitely weak, but regional districts won't change that. Many people, including House Speaker Brian Cutler at one time, think merit selection is a better solution. Either we vote for all of our judges or none of our judges, but three is unacceptable. The real diversity goal here is to put more judges sympathetic to the current majority party on the Supreme Court in particular. Many key questions are not answered in this bill. 
how would we transfer from our current system of random uh, judicial elections as judges step down or age out? What happens when two judges live in the same district? Who decides which of them gets to run? Can judges be punished or rewarded by legislators using gerrymandering? Is House Bill 38 sloppy or is it intentionally negligent? This is why so many bad bills wind up in court. It's expensive, time consuming and unnecessary. But the legislators say they want to let the voters decide. Unfortunately, more often than not, voters will approve amendments thinking that the legislators have done their job. In fact, our legislators did not do their job. They failed to consider all aspects of this law before they passed it. What do we pay them for if not to carefully and publicly consider and vet legislation, especially for a constitutional amendment? This is why we're reaching out to you. In May, three constitutional amendments will be on the ballot. Read them carefully and consider the motivations and unintended consequences. There is some good news. House bill was quietly tabled last month because of the polite, informed, articulate, and overwhelming opposition by over 125 different groups, hundreds of op-eds, letters, and phone calls, and people like you contacting legislators. However, this worst kind of bad bill could be revived anytime, so keep an eye on it. Gerrymandering is wrong for the courts, and it's also wrong for the legislature and Congress. Fair Districts is strongly encouraging support for the Legislative and Congressional Redistricting Act, or LACRA, what we're calling the Transparency Bill. It includes many of the best practices referred to earlier. This bill retains the current procedures with legislators drawing the maps, but their work must hold up under bright and public scrutiny. There's an additional qualification for the chair of the LRC, which means no lobbyists or party operatives or spouses of those folks. It forbids districts that protect incumbents. It forbids discrimination against a political party. It will conform to the Voting Rights Act and protect racial and language minorities from discrimination. All meetings must be held in public, be live streamed and multilingual. Meetings must comply with the open meetings law. It requires a publicly available written report of decisions, rationale and the process for the choices made, which will be available for 10 years. LACRA requires a user-friendly website with free public access to data, preliminary maps and analyses and other information. Four public hearings will be held across the state with, for the preliminary maps to gather input, then four more to review final maps one more time before they're completed. All Pennsylvanians would have the ability to submit a redistricting plan or part of a plan which the committee must review. LACRA would adhere to the requirement to create compact and contiguous districts. It requires enforceable limits on splits. For example, the number of districts required by population within a county plus one. As second tier concerns and to the extent possible without violating other criteria, the districts would be required to keep communities of interest intact. That's where we were talking about school districts. Be responsive to voter preferences as measured by widely accepted tests and conform district boundaries to natural boundaries like rivers and mountains. So I've given you a lot of information. Unless they hear from you, our legislators have no reason to make changes. What can you do right now to make a difference? Call, write, or meet with your legislators to say, please oppose House Bill 38 for judicial districts and support House Bill 22 and Senate Bill 222, the LACRA bills. Invite a speaker to learn more. We're available by Zoom anywhere in the state for groups large and small. If you go to the Fair Districts PA website, one of the uh, options under taking action is to invite a speaker. And with Zoom, uh, it's easy. You can write a letter to the editor to say we need better legislative rules and we do not need judicial districts. Connect the dots for them. Say here are the bills that have huge public support, pass them and don't force through the bills with no public support. We want our elected representatives to do a better job representing us, the voters. Calls are great because they have to be heard, logged, transcribed and messages delivered. If you're shy, call and leave a message when the office is closed. The Harrisburg offices have the more knowledgeable staff about legislative opinions and questions. The local offices are not really equipped as well for that. Judicial districting is tabled for now 
only because we all piled on and got their attention. Here are the party leaders in the Senate. I'll give you time to take a photo or screenshot here. Remember the leaders control the agenda, so we start with them. The bills will go first to the state government committees, so reach out now to all of those folks. They have said publicly they want to hear from regular voters. Plan what you wanna say or write so you can make efficient use of your time. You can draft your text and copy and paste it to each member in an email. Reach out to your friends in other advocacy groups to also. After we're done today, I'll send you a follow-up sheet with links to these lists where you can find everyone's contact information. So here are the house leadership folks for another screenshot if you wanna grab those names. So right now, Fair District's big project is what we're calling the March Toward Transparency. Uh, we are helping to train and coordinate member volunteer visits, member volunteers from every county in the state to have constituent Zoom meetings with all 253 representatives and senators to urge co-sponsorship and public support for the LACRA bills. To just yesterday, in fact, a group of six new volunteers from rural Northwest Pennsylvania in Warren, Clarion and Forest counties and Venango, and Butler County, this one Senator has five counties that he spills through, and, and uh, they successfully added Republican Senator Scott Hutchinson to the list of co-sponsors. Senator Hutchinson gave permission to publicly share his support, and we can always use more motivated volunteers if you'd like to join this effort. I'll be sending that follow-up sheet with a link to this as well. So we talk a lot about how gerrymandering exacerbates extreme partisanship by making politicians accountable only to their own committed primary voters and donors. Extreme partisanship is a problem because it creates high stakes flashpoints that don't need to exist. This judicial gerrymandering nonsense is happening because members of one party are very upset about a court decision in 2018. And that court decision happened because members of the other party were very upset about the gerrymander in 2012. If judicial gerrymandering passes, it'll create yet another set of districts for the two parties to fight to the death to control, which will harden partisan divisions even further. We have stalled judicial gerrymandering before it's enacted for now, but to borrow a line from the Wizard of Oz, we want it not just merely dead, but most sincerely dead. By enacting the LACRA bills, we can turn the redistricting process into a mundane civic function rather than a decade old partisan thunderdome. LACRA will allow the next redistricting in 2021 to take place with strict guardrails. It will be intrinsically de-escalatory simply because there will be one less pointless fight to be had. That leaves a lot more time for legislators to do the work we pay them to do. So I'm going to stop my share. I'm going to stop my recording. And I can take questions now. Yes, there were no questions that came up in the chat, but I think we were all just sort of entranced listening to you explain <laughs> all of this to us. I think it's something that you know, many of us are just sort of peripherally aware of, but when you actually look at the maps and see how it translates neighborhood by neighborhood, I, I think it's just, um, it, it's, it's fascinating really to see how it happens. So um, it, please, if you have any questions about anything that Debbie um, presented, whether it's a more a drilled down a little bit more on some of the, the logistics of it or what can we do um, or how it might relate to the address book and what we were what we read um, as we were going through that. So um, just remember if you have a question to unmute yourself or if you'd rather put it in chat, I will be able to um, read that for you as well. Okay, um, I do see someone asked, how does it expect a, a school district? So you would think that a school district community, as small as they are, would be best served by a single legislator. And, and some legislators in, in state college area have said, oh, look, you don't have just one, you have four. And my response would be, no, we don't have four, we have one quarter, because we are a big community in this case, 
And uh, our representatives are divided by rural areas that go way, way far away. If you look at the bigger districts. So a school district is even a smaller subset and uh, State College in particular, I know is split among three districts or three different representatives in the house. And it's a problem when they need help um, when, when you go to your representative. How will LACRA determine if an incumbent is protected? Uh, they look at metrics. Um, well, okay, thinking about uh, the congressional districts, if we go from 18 to 17, um, there could be some very interesting choices made about who's going to lose their seat. Um, I think you look for something like very interesting squiggles to pull somebody's house address in because they do have to live in their district. The folks that testified in the 2017 court case um, had lots of very detailed uh, ways to evaluate our maps. And every one of them demonstrated that our maps were gerrymandered as much as they possibly could have been. They got greedy. And uh, so um, I remember one of the people that testified drew like 50 possible, or no, I think it was 500, 500 possible maps and looked at where they fell on a, on a graph. And his were sort of clustered in one corner. And the maps that we actually have were, were way out in Pluto land. Um, and if our, our maps had made one tiny change, they would have actually been slightly less gerrymandered. And, and he had examples where he uh, tried to make the maps as compact as possible, another where he tried to make them as competitive as possible. Uh, there, you know, there are different choices you can make. There's not one single map which is the best, but, but there's a range and you would expect reasonable maps to fall within that range. Um, can you talk a little bit, Debbie, about the delay in the census information? Um, one of the things that our library was particularly involved in was, was helping people complete the census this year. And it was like really challenging because of COVID. And a lot of the plans that we had to, to, to work with people to feel comfortable filling out the census um, just weren't able to happen. And the census data is hugely important in providing the the base of, of legislative districting. Um, with the delay that's going to be happening, how is that going to impact um, the process? Um, we actually think less than you might imagine. Um, it's certainly possible to set up the website now. It's possible to start thinking about congressional maps now with 17 districts. If you use the current data um, and then you can drop in the new data and let it adjust. Um, you can set up dates for hearings now and have everything ready to go so that when the data comes, it drops in. And it doesn't take six months to use a computer to create districts. Mm, okay. As somebody demonstrated, she did it in two hours. Um, even if you uh, were more thoughtful and you know took the time, uh, I, I would think it could be done in a matter of weeks. Okay. So I don't think there is a good reason for delaying uh, future primaries or, or redistricting results. I think if they are proactive, and I was happy to see that they've already named the, the four members of the Legislative Redistricting Commission, and they're starting the process for choosing that fifth person. They're inviting people to submit applications. So uh, that looks good to me. And I saw too that the uh, David Argall, he's the chair of the, I believe it's the Senate State Government Committee, has uh, put up a bill to take some language from our LACRA legislation for the requirements for that fifth person, requiring um, a more transparent and objective person, no lobbyists, no spouses, that kind of thing. So that to me bodes well that okay. he's looking ahead. Uh, now, if we can ask him to pick up the rest of the bill while he does that, uh, that could be very interesting. What if our bill became the amendment to that little one? Oh. Thank you. Um, Eunice had a question in chat. Can you see that one? Yes. Uh, the vaccine rollout are related. Oh gosh, I don't think so. <laughs> um, I think the COVID rollout has 
that that was a state thing. That's not something that the legislature controls. Um, I will give them uh, points for doing the best they could in a trying situation. Uh, I know that it was tough to get supplies of the vaccine. Um, I, I would take points away for not having a statewide uh, website and some way to get on a wait list and then you get notified when someplace near you has vaccines available. That was unfortunate. But I don't think you can pin that on gerrymandering. Um. Uh, okay, somebody liked my Wizard of Oz reference. We're, give, we're giving our age yeah. away. <laughs> um, <laughs> could be a model for how government might... Do I find pen, fair districts tends to track more or less partisan in terms of its makeup? Um, you know, everybody has their opinion when they go into the voting booth. We all make choices. But those of us involved with Fair District and certainly the public advocacy uh, go, I try to go out of my way to wear my nonpartisan hat. I don't want this. I know that there are Democrats in the legislature that are salivating because it's finally their turn uh, because that fifth person is, you know, they assume would be chosen by the majority of the state Supreme Court. Um, so there are Democrats in, in the legislature that are not big fans of ours right now. And I don't care. Um, I, I think it's a badge of honor that both sides uh, are irritated by <laughs> what we're asking for. Um, I know in Maryland, it's the Democrats that gerrymandered that state and Republicans are upset. Here in this state, it's the Republicans that took advantage of a situation and the Democrats are the aggrieved party. So I think it's not surprising that uh, a lot of Democrats are screaming louder. Um. Um, to circle back to the address book, I have a personal experience being um, when I lived in Westmoreland County, being in one of those districts that um, people on one side of the street were represented by one representative and on the other side by another. And um, I think one of the interesting things this morning was really understanding how where you live does impact who you get to vote for. Um, I kind of knew that, but I guess I didn't really know how who you vote for impacts what kinds of bills and legislation actually gets passed. Um, I thought that was a really interesting um, follow because I, I just didn't really have that sense that, that that's really where an impact was felt. Um, um, comment. Any other further comments or questions? How are we doing on time? We're, we're, we're right up there around 11 o'clock. So I think we're doing pretty well. There was a question in chat about whether or not the program would be um, available. It will be on our, our YouTube channel. We will also be sending out the link. Debbie, would you be able to send out your slide deck? I, no. <laughs> okay, that's fine. All right. Um, and um, if anybody would be interested in having um, Fair District Pennsylvania make a presentation to an organization you're with, I will be able to share Debbie's contact information with any of you and you can reach out to her directly. Um, yes, uh, that's a very good point. Uh, one of the listeners on another uh, presentation was a college student and asked if uh, she could share it with her professor and, and I could be available for uh, classes like that or any other group, large, small book clubs, church groups, whatever. Um, so. We'll talk to anybody. <laughs> right. So thank you all very much. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions, you can just um, email them to me and we'll get them to Debbie and she can kind of respond directly. You also said something, if I remember, about having a page of resources available. <laughs> Yes, that's what I'm okay. going to send to you. And my okay. email is in that. You are welcome to email me directly. That's All right. fine. So thank there you will, so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there will be some follow-up for those of you who want to share out this information. And I also want to remind everyone that Deborah Mask, the author of the address book, will be um, Zooming in with us Tuesday evening. Um, that's Tuesday, 
the 23rd at 7 o'clock. Um, if you haven't registered, please visit the Center County Reads website and um, find the registration link. And um, it'll be interesting to hear what the author of the book has to say about all of this as well. So thank you all again very much. It's a beautiful day outside. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you. Thank you.